I mentioned paradoxes in the first rule that uh, Descartes mentions uh, on page 11. Let's read it through again. The first, the first rule for the direction of the mind, first rule for conducting one's reason well is uh, never to accept anything as true that I did not plainly know to be such. Of course, that begs the question, how do you know uh, that anything is true? So, you know, it immediately brings up the problem of the criterion of truth. That is to say, carefully to avoid hasty judgment and prejudice, and to include nothing more in my judgments than what presented itself to my mind so clearly and so distinctly that I had no occasion to call it in doubt. That last part is crucially important. Because he does suggest, whether it's useful or not, uh, what the criterion of truth is. Wow, you know, uh, Sextus Empiricus, listen up, because here it is. The criterion of truth is uh, clarity and distinction, or distinctness, whatever the proper noun form would be. That is, when something is very clear and very distinct, so clear and distinct that you have no occasion to call it into doubt, then apparently your, your thought is true, your idea is true, whatever you want to put it. Um, again, as a rule of thumb, very handy. I mean, that is, uh, what else can we work with? Uh, we have a notion that some of our thoughts are clear, relatively so, and some of them are obscure, relatively so. Some of them have clarity, and some of them are fuzzy and, and, and confusing. And uh, we prefer the ones that are clear. Uh, we have more faith in the ones that are, that are clear. But is this really a sufficient criterion for truth? I mean, that is, on a practical level, it may be useful. On a philosophical level, is it really adequate? Again, that's a question that runs through Descartes' philosophy uh, all the way through, and is a, something that you should yourself evaluate, whether he really, whether that really pays off, that uh, clearness and distinctness, clarity and distinction. The other thing there is doubt, of course, and that's very, very important. That is that, and it may help. That is, those thoughts, uh, those ideas, those opinions, that are so clear and distinct that I cannot doubt them. That is, I can find no basis for doubting their truth. They must be true. Now that is maybe even you know, more important. Uh, Descartes' philosophy, and that may be more substantive. That is, if we ask ourselves what can be doubted and what can't be doubted, then if we say that something is at least capable of being doubted, an idea, an assertion, a belief, then we are admitting that, from our perspective at least, that it could be false, not even if it appears true, and, and but, but it's doubtable that it could be false. If something can't be doubted, if something's incapable, if we just find ourselves unable to doubt its truth, if we found, find somehow that doubt negates itself when we apply it to a certain belief, assertion, statement, idea, then we should think about that. Does that mean that it must be true because we can't doubt it? You know, Sextus Empiricus might have some thoughts about that. We should perhaps remember him, refer to him. So the, 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 the next four rules are, uh, you know, not as philosophically rich. They seem to be more, really, again, practical rules of thumb. The second rule, to divide each of the difficulties I would examine into as many parts as possible, and as was required in order to better to resolve them. That's analysis. That's uh, simplification. That's reductionism. The notion that, you know, the things in the world that we're trying to understand are complex, and it's much harder to grasp a complex entity, a complex thought, a complex idea, than a simple one. So if something is capable of being broken down into its simple parts, that we uh, are in a better position to understand it. That's, of course, a very, very important principle in modern thought, especially uh, in ancient thought. But you know, the, the notion that the way that we understand the world, especially in science is to break it down to its simplest parts. I mean, think of how much that idea paid off in modern chemistry, for instance, discovery of elements. You know, 
modern physics in the discovery of the, the evolving discovery of the structure of matter. This is very, very important. Uh, third rule, the third, to conduct my thoughts in orderly fashion by convincing with those objects that are simplest and easiest to know in order to ascend little by little as by degrees to the knowledge of the most composite things and by supposing an order even among those things that do not naturally precede one another. Again, that's sort of like the opposite of the second rule. The, the second rule is analysis, which we break things down into their simplest parts. The third rule is, uh, I guess, take a chance and call it synthesis. That is, after we've broken things down into the simplest parts, and this, starting with the simplest principles, then we sort of sort of build things up step by step, very carefully, in order to understand the, the complex things. But only when we've broken things down into their simplest parts. And the last, the fourth rule: everywhere to make enumerations so complete and reviews so general that I was assured of having omitted nothing. Isn't that called checking your work? He is a mathematician, and not only is he a mathematician, he's a mathematician who has so thoroughly influenced modern mathematics that maybe he started the rule, you know, checking your work. Uh, that's what he's doing, checking your work. I mean, looking back over what you've done and, 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 and thinking about it. It's, he didn't invent this rule, man, but it's just so important in everything, not only in, in math, where it's, you know, it's fatal not to check your work, right? Uh, but in thinking in general, certainly in, in, in writing, um, you know, checking your work is looking back over what you've written and asking yourself whether, on the one hand, it makes sense, and secondly, whether things are as clear as you could have put them. I mean, it's absolutely essential to good writing and you know, good everything. He's right. It's not a big revelation that you should check your work, but it's a darn important thing to do. So, uh, what is the payoff here? Well, I mean, um, again, you see, he's thinking of mathematics. Look what he immediately goes on to say on page 11. Those long chains of utterly simple and easy reasoning that geometers commonly use to arrive at their most difficult demonstrations had given me occasion to imagine that all the things that can fall within human knowledge follow from one another in the same way, and that provided only that one abstained from accepting any of them as true that is not true, Again, begging the question, how the heck did you do that? And that one always adheres to the order one must follow in deducing the ones from the others. So he's thinking of deductive conclusions. He's thinking of, if I know this, what can I deduce from it? Well, that, and what can I deduce from that, that, you know, sort of a chain of reasonings, step by step, careful deductive reasoning. There cannot be any that are so remote that they are not eventually reached nor so hidden, they are not discovered. And I was not very worried about trying to find out which of them it would be necessary to begin with, for I already knew that it was with the simplest and easiest to know. That should also be very reminiscent. I'm thinking of Aristotle. You know, the principles. He's talking about the principles, the, the starting points. <coughs> Where do we start? Well, we start with what is clear to us. We start with what appears to us to be so clear that it must be true. The idea of self-evident truth. That the whole is greater than the part, for instance, Euclid's geometry, or the principle of non-contradiction, as Aristotle said, is the foundation of logic and all rational discourse. You know, those things that are very, very simple, very, very clear. We start with them, and then step by step, laboriously, we deduce other more complicated things, and, and really fascinating. You know, I mean, it goes on on page twelve. Um, you know, borrowing all that is best in geometrical analysis and algebra, and also you know the methods of logic. Um, in a very, I, I think that this is a reference to his his work uh, in mathematics. You know, the, the, the groundbreaking work he did. In mathematics, and you may want to look into that yourself. You know what exactly did Descartes do? Geometrical analysis, algebra. Uh, but he applied this method, and he got, he got some big results. You know, and uh, it worked. And and the idea is that the method that he used in mathematics could be extended to everything. It's a very big point that he makes. So that's what we have to ask ourselves: 
will it work? 